CataractCoach.com. This sign means that I do not need a pupil ring. And I can tell right at the beginning of the case. I'm going to show you a complete cataract case. If you don't have six minutes of time to spend here, then, gosh, find it on the YouTube channel. But let's watch this case here. So you can see I've marked off the cardinal meridians. We're going to put a torque lens in here. We're going to put our anesthetic. Now here comes the viscoelastic. We'll try to do a little bit of viscomedriasis, as Osher calls it. And that's about the max pupil size we're going to get. This patient does take flow max, and this is all you get with multiple doses of dilating drops. So let's make our main incision here using a diamond keratome. And now here's how I measure the rex and measure the pupil. Remember, my forceps are marked off with two marks. One is two and a half millimeters. The other is five millimeters from the tip. So that, just, that sign just there, I just did it very quickly, shows me that this is a five millimeter pupil. And there's no corneal magnification or minification issues because, remember, I'm marked off on the instrument and the instrument's inside the eye. So that's a solid and honest 5 millimeter pupil. So we're going to do our rexes right up against the pupil margin. So the reason I know I don't need some sort of ring or hooks or anything else is it's a 5 millimeter pupil to begin with. I do not need a bigger pupil than 5 millimeters. And hey, surprise, neither do you. So don't put a pupil ring in this case. You don't need it. So here's the hydro dissection. One thing that's going to be helpful, especially in a flow mask guy like this, is to get that nucleus up out of the capsule bag. There it is, and tilt it on its side. So there's the whole nucleus. Now you can see the pupil is actually holding the nucleus for me. A little bit of aliquot of uh, dispersive viscoelastic there to protect the cornea. Here comes the phaco probe, chop mode, high vacuum, high flow. 40 cc's a minute, 500 millimeters of mercury vacuum, some phaco power, get that chopper around, boom, there's the nucleus split in half. And all we got to do is emulsify that first half, take that out, notice how I'm operating at the Irish plane and staying centrally. And once the first half is out, we can just push over the second half and do the same thing. Now the pupil may come down further in this case, and that's to be expected. Remember, the patient's a flow max patient uses tamsulosin, and that's going to cause this pupillary um, meiosis and that floppy iris as well. So we get the nucleus out pretty much cleaned up, and we're just about ready for the IA probe. So you notice how efficient this technique is. So we've also marked off the cornea at the correct steep axis, in addition to those black marks there, which are the cardinal meridians. And that's going to help us place our torque a monofocal eye well in the capsular bag. This patient's also previously hyperopic, and this hyperopic patient had hyperopic LASIK, which you know I'm not a huge fan of, because it creates that small optical zone, that very steep central cornea. And so in this case, we are going to put in a monofocal lens. I'm not a big fan of using a diffractive or trifocal type lens in a patient who had a couple diopters of hyperopic LASIK. I think the cornea has too many aberrations, which will confound things with that trifocal. So here we're going to do a monofocal lens. Inflating our capsule bag here with our viscoelastic, we'll get that trifocal, no, the toric, non-trifocal, the toric monofocal lens implanted there in the capsule bag. There it goes. Nicely done. Of course, my technician and I have done like 10,000 Ks together, so I always know the lens will be loaded perfectly. Getting the lens into approximate position and getting those haptics open up and ensuring they're lifting up the hours, making sure that IOL is completely in the capsule bag and looking around to make sure there's no residual cortex. Just a quick check in all quadrants using that chopper. Time to remove the physical elastic. We're going to go underneath the IOL because remember, torque lens, I want that posterior aspect of the optic to sit directly on the posterior capsule, and that's going to help prevent it from spinning around or becoming misrotated or malrotated. So as the visible as it comes out of the eye, we can see that looks like a nicely positioned lens. We can use our chopper here now and, and lift up the iris and see if it's in good position or nudge it over a little bit more. And the IA probe in the right hand is giving us the infusion to keep the eye inflated. And so that all looks really good. Pretty happy with the outcome here. And then once we just finally get an exact position, we can seal up and finish the case. So as you can see, it's a pretty efficient case. But the one thing I use 
at the beginning of the cases, prior to creating the caps rexis, I used those forceps, which have marks at two and a half and five millimeters from the tip. And I used them and I measured the existing pupil. And if I already have a four and a half or five millimeter pupil, like in this case, I'm basically done. You don't need to have a bigger dilation than five millimeters because you're going to do a five millimeter rexus, right? So in a case like this, we measure it. I know it's good. I'll get that rexus done. We'll get that nucleus partially prolapsed out of the capsule bag. That nucleus helps hold it still. And then we can bring it up and chop it and finish the case. End of the case here, a little triamcinolone going inside the eye. That's going to help really quell any post-op inflammation. We'll also put a small aliquot of preserve-free moxifloxacin in the eye just to help prevent endophthalmitis. And we'll check our incisions and everything looks great. So beautiful case. Thanks for watching.